Yeah, that's fine. I think my wife did that too recently. All right. We're live at Faith Alive Fellowship. So it kind of runs in the family, I guess. But we got it. We finally got our, our buttons turned on and ready to go. Amen. So once again, I want to say thank you to Pastor Tom Stella for giving me the opportunity to t teach tonight from the Word of God. Amen. Aren't you glad you're not going to hear Pastor Tim's opinion? <laughs> Amen. Uh, their opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got them, right? <laughs> Lord, we just thank you tonight. We ask that you would use me to teach the Word and to feed ourselves the Word of God tonight and everybody watching, that we'd have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And we want to thank you, Lord, for it ahead of time, that as we look into your Word, that you give us revelation and show us what we need to know in these last days. And everybody said, amen. in Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew chapter 24, if you don't mind turning over there with me, Matthew 24. One time I was working at a job, and uh, it was a good coffee house, you know, enjoyed that coffee, and my boss was always very positive, and you know, so was I, but sometimes the Bible is not all that positive regarding certain things, and, and I remember the person saying, you know, the, the things are just getting better and better you know, generally speaking, in the world. And I said, well, not really. Well, why is that? Well, the Bible says, verse 37, As the days of Noah were, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And in verse 38 it says, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two will be in the field, the one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, the one will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord does come. Amen? Amen. I'm just going to read this to you in John 16, if you want to look at it later. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic, which completely overshadows the Amplified Update, although the Amplified Update has some really good highlights. But for the most part, the Classic is, like, pff, way better. Verse 33, and that's not my opinion, it just is. Amen. <laughs> Verse 33, chapter 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. Who would like to have perfect peace and confidence right now with what's going on? In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. And yes, that does even mean Walmart. Amen. Amen. Yes. My wife and my kids were at Walmart literally 30 minutes ago, and the report was this. They had one of those situations where somebody was watching inside the building, tracking younger children. My kids are always with my wife anyways or with me. And then the person outside is waiting, and then they have a getaway car. So it's happening in your town of Surgeon Bay. So if you see that, take a photo of them and say, smile, and then report it to the police because you'll want to know if they're here in town or if they're from out of town. So this is, I've heard this happening in various places, because uh, the devil loves kidnapping and stealing people. He, li he likes to murder people, but if they're really young, he likes to steal them and then do what he wishes. So uh, just remember that. Keep an eye on your small children everywhere you go. Do not take any chances. Do not leave it to chance. Psalm 91 works for you if you're not foolish. You know, if you're subjecting, if you are wearing your seatbelt, locking your doors, Psalm 91 works great. If you're kind of like a stupid Christian who just says, oh, the Lord's just got to be covered. No. There's so many scriptures I could share with you in Proverbs that say, you know, you you got to, like, make wise planning and wise decisions. Amen? So that's another message. In the world you have tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration, but be of good cheer. Lord, be of good cheer. What's going on in Israel right now? Be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. It's like the Bible says, you know, do not fear those who can kill the body, but the one who can, you know, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, we have to look at those eternal things. Of course, we don't just stand here and twiddle our thumbs when people are trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Luke chapter... 18, verse 8, you don't have to turn there, but it says, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's a good question. The NLT says, How many will he find on the earth who have faith? 
Luke chapter 10, if you want to turn with me over there, that's a, this is a pretty good one. Luke chapter 10. I like Luke chapter 10. I mean, just Luke, the book. It's a really good gospel. You know, he was the physician, so he, you can tell it when he talks. You know, it's just a little bit more like, you look at the first opening paragraph of the Gospel of Luke, and you can see it, just the way he describes things. It kind of sounds like the Declaration of Independence a little bit. Verse 38 says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, that is Jesus, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And the Amplified says, seated herself at the Lord's feet and was listening to his teaching. But Martha, overly occupied and too busy. Have you ever done that? You ever caught yourself getting overly occupied and too busy? Yeah. But I'm doing good things. It doesn't matter. You're overly occupied and too busy if you can't stop and give the Lord some praise for a moment, you know. Or stop and meditate the word for a little while. We do that all the time and there's no excuse for it. You know, whether you're doing something good or bad, I'd rather err on the side of doing something good, of course, but you don't want to be distracted with much serving. She came up to him and said, Lord, is it nothing to you that my sisters left me to serve alone? Is it nothing to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? So it's always, when someone's like that, it's always somebody else's fault. It's always finger pointing, you know, and then you have to go, oh, me, that's the problem. Tell her then to help me to lend a hand and do her part along with me. But the Lord replied to her by saying, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. Or the Remedy Bible says, you're too preoccupied to listen. There is, not, there is need of only one or but a few things. Mary has chosen the good portion, that which is to her advantage, which shall not be taken away from her. Or uh, the Message Bible kind of does a play on, you know, like she's preparing food or something, right? And the Message says, it's the main course. You know, spending time with the Lord, that's the main course. So why would we just have cupcakes or, you know, have an appetizer or something when we can have the meat and potatoes, which is spending time with the Lord? So it's very important, you know, to ask ourselves every day, am I a Martha or am I a Mary, you know? And we make a choice every day what we want to do. So what we want to do in these last days is be putting God first and giving him, like the book of Colossians says, the preeminence. So... I'm going to be preaching to you guys over here, but I'm also preaching to the chairs over here because you know what? It looks a little odd on the camera if I'm just like looking in one direction. So just giving you a heads up, I'm going to, I'm going to preach to some angels over here, some big old honkers. Good, good angels, amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> talking about other things lately. Matthew 7, if you don't mind, turn over there. We're going to do a couple more scriptures. So, you know, when you saw Martha and Mary there, I mean... Technically, they both received him into their house, like a lot of Christians, like, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And then what do you do after? One of them, they live like the world, they go right back into their old garbage. But I'm saved, God loves me, he knows my heart, you know. And then the other one is like sold out, consecrated every day, you know. It's a big difference. And God doesn't want that garbage of like, you know, I love you, Lord. He's like, so you love me, but you do nothing I tell you to do? Uh, so, yeah, it would be the same being a parent, you know. If my kids said that they love me, but every time I ask them to do the dishes, they, the dishes sit there dirty, or I tell them to go do the laundry and the laundry doesn't get done, they don't love me. That ain't love. You know what I'm saying? Love is an action. It's not, I love you, Pastor Tim. This is a great church. I want to be part of the army of the Lord. Five minutes later, they're gone. You know, Or they, they slather you and flatter you with compliments. Like, I don't need that anyways. I don't, care. I don't need to be complimented by people. I don't need to be insulted. You know, none of us need that. We don't need to flatter each other. And they're, and they're gone in like three months or a year or something. Well, gosh, you didn't have a whole lot of stick to you know, preaching to the chairs over here, you know. But, yeah, that's the thing you got to be careful about, I heard from, I don't know if it was Mark Barkley, not, not preaching to people that aren't here. They're not here to listen to it. It's us that want to make sure we don't turn into that. But I thought about that 20 years ago. Like, what does make me different? What makes me different than, uh, well, i got to make sure I walk in love. I'm not getting offended by people in the church or outside of the church or whatever. i got to make sure I'm walking down the straight and narrow road, you know, like on Pilgrim's Progress, you know, and being a doer of the word. And, ah, uh, going to church. 
what's wrong with going to church? Amen. So every time that door's open, I was there. I've missed a few services over the years, but I don't like missing church. It's like walking around without my pants on. Does anyone need to see that? You know, my wife ain't going to complain, but I mean, well, she probably would be a little red faced. But the point I'm trying to make is, like, what's wrong with getting on the ark? The rain's coming. Get ready, you know. Get in the ark. It's the only safe place there is. So, verse 24 in chapter 7 of Matthew. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house on a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. Does anyone feel like they've been beat on this week, or in the past month, yes. or since 2020, yes. and all of the injustice and all of the garbage that's gone on in America? Well, I'd say don't give up, because keep being a doer of the word, and you'll never fall. That scripture says it right there. I don't have to be intimidated by all this garbage, even if it's knocking on my own back door, you know. I just keep doing the Word of God, like I've been doing for 20 years. I don't, I don't need to let anyone fear, you know, fear me out of it or worry me out of it. But check this out. Everyone that hears these things of mine and does them not will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So you would laugh at somebody if they just built a house on sand, wouldn't you? Like go down to the beach, and they're building a big, beautiful house. Thing starts, like, tipping. And the water comes up, and it's just like banging against. Like, that'd be kind of stupid, right? Yeah. It happens all the time in church. You hear people that just, you know, hallelujah every, everywhere, right back at you. And it's like, you got to do the word. You have to do what it says. So it's, that's the important thing, you know. You can even start out, like, horrendous, just like I did. It's how you end. I don't care if you look like the most punk kind of kid that ever walked the planet, you know. Just learn to do the Word of God. Like, if it says work hard, go work hard. If it says do a good job and obey your, your authorities, get, get out there and obey your authorities. As long as they're not asking you to sin. I've never had a boss ask me to sin. I just, you know, they just said clean the floor, Tim, or go do this, Tim, and I go do it. I learn to work hard, you know, and if you don't work, you don't eat, and I like to eat, so I better work. Because if I don't, eat, sooner or later I'll be dead. So that's what God's saying, is like, you ain't worth nothing if you ain't going to work. So, unless you're like handicapped or something, you're incapacitated, that's a different situation. But uh, we're here in America, and there's a land of opportunity out there, and there's a land of work hard, blood, sweat, and tears, too. Matthew 25, verse 1. So we're talking about the wise and foolish. They both heard the word. They both sat in church. Both listened to Pastor Tom's message but only one of them did it. They're here. The other one's been gone for a long time, and they're hip-hopping through different churches, you know, and they're struggling, and they're going to deliverance services and whatnot. So I'm sorry I can't help you. You're not locked into a good local church. What's it going to do if I cast the devil out of you, you know? I don't know. Some, every case is different. I get it. But that's, that's kind of where a lot of American Christians are. Get into a good local church. It'll set you free. Amen. Submit to a good pastor. Absolutely. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So you got ten virgins. you got ten Christians, let's say. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So maybe you could say five were like Mary, five were like Martha. They're just so caught up with all the problems, you know. They, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. It's just like... Before I came to Sturgeon Bay today, if I didn't, like, fill up my tank full of gas and I just had enough to go, like, 10 miles, why would you do that? It's like, why would you do that? You're living, why would you live your Christian life without a prayer life? Why be a, why be a Christian and not go to church, you know? I don't understand. It's like even, like, having a garden and not watering the garden, Putting it in like the shade where it never gets any sun, like don't even have a garden then. What's the point of that, you know? You gotta take care of your stuff. Well, the bridegroom Terry, they all slumbered and slept, so it's okay to sleep at night. I know sometimes it's difficult with stuff going on and the Lord will wake us up and pray, but it's all right to slumber and sleep. Amen. You know, we need we do need to take care of ourselves at the same time. But at the midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. They didn't say, Please, can you help us? Say, Give us. People like that are always, Give us something. They're always coming to church, Give me something. Give me something. Give me a word, man. Give me a word. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But the people that are spending time with the Lord, our prayer people, they don't have something to say all of the time. They're usually the listeners, They're usually the ones asking questions. How was your day? How have you been? And they sit and listen, and then they'll pray for you. There's a huge difference between the two. Amen? Amen. And the foolish said, The wise give us of your oil. Our lamps are gone out. But the wise answer said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go, go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Well, they went to buy. The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in. You could highlight that if you want in your Bible. They that were ready went in. The Amplified says those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage and guess what happened? The door wasn't left open. You guys could come on in sometime whenever you feel like it. Whenever you get your oil, come on in. No, he didn't say that. He just shut the door. And he didn't, like, slam it. He doesn't have, like, a bunch of attitude like people do. But, you know, he shut the door, and that's not a door that can be opened. Once it shuts, it shuts. Okay? Afterward, just like the Noah's Ark, the Bible says that Noah didn't shut that door. God shut him in. Because there was just no other way. So God shut it in. He filled it in with pitch or whatever. That door was shut, though. It wasn't, oh, I feel bad for some of those giants. They're hurting so bad. They're, you, can see, you can see them out there. They're really struggling. Nope. Nope. That's it. You know, you just obey God. As, you know, maybe he could hear stuff outside of that ark. But sorry, the door's shut. I was instructed to save me, my wife, my kids, and their wives, and that's it. All the eight of us. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Amen. That's a pretty loaded scripture. But that oil always represents to me, it's just having a relationship with Jesus. It's going to church. It's being a tither. And not starting tither and then getting offended and then not tithing anymore. That's usually one of the first things you see when people start to backslide. They stop tithing because the money's tied to their hearts. And because they don't care about God anymore, they don't want to sow into the church anymore. You know? It's just the way it is. So, what is the foundation of our Christian lives? It's doing the sayings of Jesus. It's not just hearing something going, oh, that's a nice message. That was wonderful. And then you go back to doing whatever you're doing. And if it's one of those habitual sins or things that keeps, you know, sidetracking, you just keep bringing it to God at the communion table, whatever you got to do. You know, a lot of it's just little stuff that try to sidetrack us, you know, those, those things in our family lines. Our dad, our grandpa, if you met your great-grandpa, he had that problem. Your great-great-grandpa probably had that problem, you know, runs in family lines, unfortunately. But you can overcome it through the blood of Jesus. But you have to want to also, like, you have to desire to be, to be free from it. A lot of times you meet people there, they want to get free from this thing. But when it comes to these other things, they want to just keep doing that. And that's all devils all the same. So you can't pick and choose. You're going to be consecrated to just be sold out to Jesus, and that's it. Whatever you want, Lord, you know. I remember being up in Fish Creek uh, after I met Pastor Tom and Stella and Jennifer, the Terry family, which is pretty cool. The Terry family, the name is the motto of the Terry family. I like to say this periodically because there's so many new people that come in. The, like, the foundation, the founders of the church, the last name actually means from the cross, a lion. Ex Cruce Leo. I dug that out of wherever I dug it from, but I found sources. And I, I've seen a lot of really cool English family mottos, but I've never seen one like that. And if that isn't like blatantly pointing to Calv Cav Calvary, it's easy to say Cavalry because I study the American history so much, it's, it's easy to see that, what they, what they pull that from. So pretty cool anyways. I think uh, I, I, the one that I had in my family tree wasn't nearly as cool, but it was an old Roman saying. First Timothy 4.1, uh, you don't have to turn there, it's just one scripture I want to look at, because we've read it so many times with Pastor Tom before. Uh, First Timothy, there we go. I love the book of Timothy. I like to joke around with my brother. I say, I got your beat, brother. He's like, how's that? 
I got two books, you got one. <laughs> so anyways, now the Spirit speaks expressly, distinctly, and expressly declares that in latter times some will turn away from the faith, giving attention to deluding and seducing spirits and doctrines that demons teach. So they turn away their attention from what's important and put it on all manner stupid things. It could even be like good things. Business could be all kinds of good things. It doesn't have to be sinful. It could just be just distractions. So sometimes this the, depicts a slowly like falling away from God over time, like Pastor Tom would call the unholy progression. Everyone say the unholy progression. We don't want the unholy progression. It's always marked by absence from church services. Someone could say, well, you're the, you're the preacher. You would say that. I wasn't the preacher, and I'm still really not the main preacher here at all, but I wasn't the preacher for 20 years, and I was saying that, okay? I was sitting in the chair just like everyone else here, enjoying a good message. So what makes you guys any different, right? You do not want to be absent from the house of God. But I want to go on vacation. That's, that's fine. You can go on vacation. What we're talking about, when it becomes like very habitual that you know, people just miss out on church, they just make whatever, you know, whatever excuse they want, and then you just don't really see them even coming anymore. I need like a really like flat bottle or something. I can't even get it inside there. We'll get a new pulpit one of these times. Not because this one isn't good, Brother Scott, but just like we were thinking about getting one of them that we had before. We'll see down the road. Ephesians chapter 5, if you don't want to, don't mind turning with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to share with you a few more scriptures. And then I got a little surprise at the end just for fun. Maybe we don't even go an hour. Maybe I, sh- maybe I don't, maybe I only go like 45 minutes tonight. Who knows? You don't need to listen to me for too long, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. That, that would actually be the toughest, is to actually sh- shrink it down a little bit for me, you know. Uh, chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, or be ye being filled. So if you're filled with the Holy Ghost once, you got to get filled, 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 keep it going, keep it going. And do it for a long time. Do it when you're at your job and nobody's looking. Don't do it making a scene. Don't do it where you're, you're irritating and ticking people off. That's not God. God doesn't act that way. He's a gentleman. You do it in a sense where you're kind of, okay, ain't nobody around. I'm on my machine right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, boss. I'll take care of that. You know, I'm just praying under my breath. It ain't offending anybody. Nobody even knows what I'm doing unless they tell them. But speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, you can sing to the Lord, amen? Giving thanks always. This will keep you out of complaining, right? Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even while it looks like the world is coming to pieces, like Israel's under attack right now. America's been under attack. I mean, look at Maui, right? Look at ever since... You know, the election of that, whatever year that was, I mean, you just, you could, you could just look at it, and it'd be pretty obvious, but somehow we can continue giving thanks always. Why is that? We're citizens of heaven. I don't want to see my country go to the gutter, but I do have to say this, no matter what happens, I'm going to fight for freedom and liberty and do whatever I can do to occupy till, I, till he comes. But I will say this, I am a citizen of heaven first and foremost. So if they want to burn you at the stake, throw you in prison and throw away the the key or whatever, you just stand your ground and be who you always have been, you know. We don't just make a good show here. This is who we are. You know, you threaten us with death or dismemberment or debt or whatever. We just do what we're called to do. We're Christians. It's who we are. We're little anointed ones, right? And God's given us boldness to live in the days we're living in. And we do not want to forsake the assembly of the saints, right? We don't want to do that because, hey, it's already hard enough as it is. Why would you want to get out there and get all shot at by the devil and all his hordes, you know? 
when you can be right here in the house. Amen. Luke chapter 21. You want to turn with me over there? We'll, we'll finish up. I think, I think three more scriptures. But I won't, I won't keep you too long here. I'm going to challenge myself to finish sooner than later. That's my personal challenge. Verse 34, if you're there with me. Uh, see, 2134, Amplified. Take heed to yourselves and be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed, weighed down with the giddiness and headache and nausea of self-indulgence. Has anyone ever self-indulged? You ever done it with food or shopping or just, I don't know, anything? And then you feel kind of crummy about it. Like, what was that about, you know? I didn't get anything really out of that. You're just kind of empty. It's a selfish behavior. And drunkenness and worldly worries and cares pertaining to the business of this life, unless that day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. For it will come upon all who live upon the face of the entire earth. Keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet, attentive, and ready, praying that you may have the full strength and ability and be accounted worthy to escape all these things taken together that will take place and stand in the presence of the Son of Man. So that's pretty loaded. Check out what some of the other translations say. Complete Jewish Bible, the worries of everyday living. The YLT, Young's Literal. The anxieties of life. The Message Bible even mentions shopping. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> the Remedy Bible says, Lest your hearts become so tied to amusement, sports, Soap operas, movies, alcohol, drugs, investments, properties, and careers as you become trapped, and the opportunity to sever ties to this selfish world passes you by. I like that Remedy Bible. It's pretty cool. So I wanted to read that scripture because it's good to like even look at that every day and just make sure that you know maybe things aren't going so well in the world, but he delivers us from this evil present world. Amen. And so we have to remind ourselves that we cannot get drunk on the cares of this life. We need to keep awake, alert, and watchful at all times. And a good way to do that, praying in tongues. Amen. James chapter 1. James is my middle names. And Brother Scott's. You didn't think I remembered that, did you? I got a mind like a trap. It's like a steel trap. Thanks, thanks to uh, Brother Scott, we're actually recording tonight. I probably would have been preaching without even having my uh, microphone on. Had that happen once, actually. James chapter 1, verse 21. Mm, let's see, we'll look at Amplified. Get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness, and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. So it's important we're in the, the church so that we can receive and welcome the word. Yeah, but I have church at home. I read my Bible at home. You're not submitted to anybody. You could go to a church, but you're just doing your own thing. You're forsaking the assembly of the saints. Amen? So we've got to be here. We're going to receive and welcome the word in this church, right? We're going to roll out the red carpet for it. Like in Colossians 3.16, it says, To let the word of Christ dwell in you. Richly, the Tyndale Bible says plenteously. So you got to let it plenteously fill up your heart, amen? And when you have that overflow, you got to let it implant and root into your heart because it, it contains the power to save your souls, your emotions and thought patterns and everything. Because we all have stinking thinking. Like that scripture that says twice, the Bible says, when a man's ways, you know, it says, <clears throat> there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end is the ways of death. That's pretty scary. That, that, the way that seems right to you, the, the, the path full of good intentions leading to death, that's how stupid we are. So it didn't say there's a way that seems wrong to a man that leads the way to death. Like if, say, I wanted to um, make some extra money on the side and deal some drugs. Well, that's obvious. That's going to end in death. Well, why don't I start doing this over here to help with uh, whatever thing that helps the poor or something? That could end in death for me. Because if it's not the Lord's will, then why are we doing that, right? Death could just mean anything. It could mean missing it. It could be wasting your time doing this when you should be over here doing this, you know? With all those good intentions and things. So 
I think about that a lot when me and my wife are sitting here going, oh, should we do this or that? A lot of times we'll just pray and ask the Lord and wait on him, and then he'll show us what we need to do. You know, even in simple things, I go, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, really. I guess we'll just pray about it. And then in the big things, those are pretty obvious. So we're not perfect at it, but very important. You know, those ways that seem like the right thing to do, watch out. Really watch out. Self-deception sometimes. Be doers of the word. Obey the message and not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. Amen. And let's finish up here in Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Actually, Matthew 6, 19. I actually have a lot of scriptures tonight. I think I counted like 12. So you guys are getting... You guys are getting loaded up. If you're taking notes, these are, I mean, these scriptures have been here in the Bible for many, many years before I ever saw them for the first time, you know? Somebody could have preached the same exact message a thousand years ago, but they're all good. It's always good whether I preach it or anybody else did, right? Matthew 6, 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, Amen. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. So what do you think those virgins were doing? The five virgins, the wise ones that had oil. They were laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. Amen. And it says, Where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, or where thieves do not break through nor steal. For your, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I love that scripture. You know, whatever you're spending your money on, whatever you're spending your time on, you know, whatever your priority is, that's what you'll do, you know. I think there's some people that just haven't discovered us yet in this area, in this region. And then there's also some people that have just willfully disobeyed. They've actually been here and they just walked away from God. Shame on them. They, they could have done some great things for God. And they decided, well, what I have is more important and my feelings are more important. And I don't like what that preacher said. That ain't going to hold any water whatsoever when you stand before God and he asks you, hey, did you do what I told you to do? Did you go down there and serve that church? No, you didn't. And you won't be able to say one cross word to God. You won't even be able to get one word out. You'll be so ashamed of yourself. We'll all have that moment, you know, where the tears will flow. But I certainly don't want to be like, yeah, I spent 50 years outside of God's will, you know. And I made it into heaven by the skin of my teeth, so to speak. I don't want that. I don't think you guys want that either. It's really important that we take this time that we have breathing air on planet earth to like do what he tells us to do last scripture of the night here in colossians chapter three colossians my favorite books letters to the church has always been ephesians philippians and colossians in those books you'll find who you are in christ you'll have those special prayers that paul prayed through the holy spirit colossians 3 Verse 1, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection or your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So my life is not in this world as much as I'm tied to it. Like I hate to see Israel attacked and innocent children killed and murdered and anything more than I'd see, like want to see my own family. Like, our lives are in Him. So our hope is in Him, and no matter what happens to us anyways, you know, we always are in Christ. So I think that's what he's talking about when he says, you know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But you're only going to get that in the presence of the Lord. There's fullness of joy at His right hand or pleasures forevermore. We're never going to find it on planet Earth. That's, that ship sailed. There's no way we're ever going to have it. And, you know, same thing with whoever is the president of the United States next, Trump or no Trump, I'm serving God. That's just the way it is. And I think we all know he's not a savior to anybody. But I didn't see also, I didn't see anyone else holding up a Bible and saying, man, this is, this is the way to go, you know. So I would say, though, that we do have to fight for freedom, fight for liberty, everything our ancestors fought for, and just do whatever we can, and don't give an inch. 
if we just stand our ground as long as it takes, maybe we live out our entire earthly lives. That's fine. Maybe he comes and takes us home before then, even better, you know. Not for the world, but for us, it's awesome. It's a reward, amen? Because when that call comes, if it's at 1.30 in the morning, I'd be like, hey, hon, you heard that? She goes, oh, yeah, we're out of here, you know? And the kids are, you know, kids are up there, too, and wait a minute, what about Thomas? Uh, We'll have a Thomas in heaven. It's all good. You know, like your favorite pets, I always think, like, they'll just be new and improved models of that in heaven anyways. So, it's all good. I mean, if Pastor Tom can have a giant duck that sings, you know what I mean? Isn't it a duck or something? Yeah. For me, I want to have, like, a giant lion that I could just, like, hop on and ride. That would be cool. be awesome. So, maybe I'll get that. So, praise God. Amen. So, yeah. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Um, just a little treat at the end of the message here. I wanted to share with you a few things. Here's a book by uh, Dennis G. Lindsay. Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. This was actually advertised by Rick Renner on his 15-part series that he's, he's dealing with some of this right now. And it's not, again, not to scare us, but to prepare us. So... If you noticed how crazy the world's getting, even here in America, but all across the world, if you watch sometimes YouTube channels when they're people that travel, you'll see the same weird tranny stuff going on all over the world. And it's like, what is that? That doesn't even, what's that got to do with football? What's that got to do with a train tour? What's that got to do with school education with little kids? Absolutely nothing. Let's throw it in. You know, and on top of that, it has... It's nutty. It's just stupid, ignorant. It's foolish. Like, I've seen clowns, and I never really liked clowns when I was a kid, but that was kind of normal, you know? Like, this stuff is just, it's just come, it's like aliens, you know? I can't, I can't describe it any, any more than you can. And you'd never thought, we never thought we'd actually be dealing with this. I mean, LGBTQIA+. Plus, I got to add that into a bylaws clause, you know, to protect our church. So, I mean, it's like how many things you need to add on to there, you alphabets gang, you know? And this started years ago when you went to Target. They used to have men and women where you changed, which is proper. And then, like, it was like six, seven, eight years ago. I couldn't even go there anymore because they combined it into a unisex. And when you go in there, it's easy to look underneath the door or over it. I'm like, I'm not, going, I'm not bringing my kids in there anymore. And I looked over at the room that used to be the girls' room. It's a storage room. Like, you didn't need to do that. You're just starting to be weird, you know? So anyways, what I did notice in this book, I'm not even done with it, but what I did find is something interesting about the state of Wisconsin. Everyone say, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. What's so interesting about Wisconsin? Well... I will tell you one thing, Wisconsin, because I like history, I was always kind of like, man, I wish we had American Revolutionary history. I wish we had battlefields. I wish we had a Civil War battlefield like Gettysburg or something, you know? And we just, we're not one of the 13 original colonies or anything like that. I was like, that's all right. We, We got some cool stuff. I'm thankful for Wisconsin. You know, it's probably one of the safest states in our whole union. I mean, you look at it, you don't have tornadoes, you don't have hurricanes. You don't have earthquakes, really. You know, you don't have, uh, for the most part, you don't have like deadly rattlesnakes, scorpions, you know, all this kind of creatures that could just, you know, terrorize you or whatever. There's like one place at Devil's Lake where there's rattlesnakes, one place in Wisconsin. But I guess the point I'm getting to is, you know, it's pretty flat too, right? It's not like the Smoky Mountains. You go to the Smoky Mountains, you just don't want to come back. You know what I mean? And you go to, like, you know, other places, see the big trees, the sequoias, you know, we don't have that. But I tell you what we do have. We have, I found out recently, that we have a lot more history than I even realized we ever had. Because of this book, I was looking at some of the articles that came on the late 1800s in the New York Times and the early 1900s that legitimately had these, you ever heard of effigy mounds? Uh, Native Americans, effigy mounds, and yeah, like they have like animal shapes, 
animal shapes and stuff like that throughout Wisconsin. So it'd be like snakes, panthers, you know, whatever. And I'll be honest, it's not tied into Christianity whatsoever. Uh, a lot of it's just, you know, worshiping the earth and creatures that think, you know, it's like the Bible said when it, was, when it came to people that worship creation more than the creator. We, we know that, but the point I'm driving at is if you just make a simple Google search of state with the most effigy mounds, it's Wisconsin. It's got more effigy mound sites than anywhere else in the world. So I thought that was really interesting. And it's like, well, why are you telling us about effigy mounds? Well, when you, if you read the book, and if you don't get it, that's fine. But take my word for it, I was reading in there. We have, I'd say, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 different effigy mounds in Wisconsin. But according to, I'm just going to read a couple snippets in this to end the night. The New York Times from like the 1870s to early 1900s would talk about giants. Like li they literally talked about unearthing giants in America, North America. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting because I'd heard little things throughout you know, my lifetime. I'd never actually seen the articles. And some people go, oh, no, that's all hokey. You know. Well, those are the same people that don't believe that there was a Noah's Ark anyways. And you can actually go see Noah's Ark right now. It's sticking out of the ground. It's kind of deteriorated, but they can see the rooms under the ground and everything. The same people that don't believe in giants because, well, there's no giants today. And where's the bones and all of this stuff? But people like that, you can't tell them anything earthly. They don't believe anything earthly. They don't believe anything heavenly either. But interesting thing, in August 7th, 1881, it says, Mounds of Wisconsin afford to the scientific world one of the most unique subjects of study as there's nothing like them in the United States or as far as known in the whole entire world. So I guess we're kind of famous. At least we were, maybe not in the last 100 years. Wisconsin's kind of famous for having more effigy mounds than any other state in the U.S. by far, which they're extremely old. They're way older than the Revolution, way older than the Civil War, and all those you know, famous things in our history. And the thing about it is you could get an argument about this with people that would say that's all Native American. I'd say, yeah, maybe some of them are Native American. But the ones that the New York Times was reporting about when they were digging into these mounds, they were giants. So Wisconsin had giants. My, my thing is, instead of Wisconsin Badgers, we could have been the Wisconsin Giants. But, you know, whatever. But there is a very interesting place. Now, talking about Wisconsin as, you know, a pastor, right? You want to know, like, why your state maybe struggles with the way that it does at times? <clears throat> you ever heard of Madison before? Madison was a huge hot spot for giants at that time. And they were just near Lake Mendota and, and things like that. But then there was this place called, if you check it out, Aztalan, which is very interesting. So giants, amen? We got Wisconsin Indian mounds, effigy mounds, and Aztalan keeps coming up. I guess you can go there today and it just kind of like this kind of ramps up and you could step up and just, you could stand on these mounds. Now, I'm not recommending you do that, but they had, they had found giants underneath when they dug into them. They're not really unearthing these things much anymore, if at all, because you know there's some laws and things that protect uh, the Native Americans and their, all their property and all their, their burial mounds. So, but yeah, Aztalan is a very unique place. It's between Milwaukee and Madison. Madison, like I said, is a very big hot spot. There was a famous battle that happened. They never gave it a name. It's so old, but they found all kinds of relics there. A lot of it's just been forgotten, buried over by many people. But anywhere from like the southern area of Wisconsin has, was a very big hot spot for a lot of these, these uh, giant colonies and whatnot. So, of course, I don't think they got along too much with the Native Americans, but... And I think it's really what happened was a lot of Native Americans actually wiped out some of these tribes. I think to finish up here, one of the things I noticed that was really interesting was that we had, I think it was, I don't know if, how I'm saying it right, but it's near like Crivets. It was like this pretty large, hundreds of skeletons were found over there. Lake Nakwa Bay or something? Nakabe. So we got somebody, you ever been there? Yeah. You, okay. So there's some Ailes Resort or Alice Resort that's closed now. 
near the outlet of the river that flows into that lake. And underneath, like three feet of water, there's hundreds of them in a mound. And they were all giants. So they were pretty far north. So they weren't just in the south region of Wisconsin. So they must have liked it a lot. I heard that Frank Lloyd Wright really liked uh, that area of Wisconsin. He said it was more beautiful than any other in the world. And so the driftless region of Wisconsin, if you've ever been to Wisconsin Dells, enough said, right? You go down to like, as you're going down toward the Mississippi River, it's just, you'd think you, I'm still in Wisconsin right now, you know? And then when you get up to where we are, it gets pretty flat. So there was a whole lot less of these type of burial mounds that were, that were finding giants in. But I thought that was very interesting that above all the states and the union, we were known for that. I mean, they were talking about some of these giants with heads as big as like a half a bushel or something. I mean, but the one I thought was pretty interesting was the article entitled, Race of Giants Lived Here, Skeletons of Mammoth Human Race Unearthed in the County. A big mound containing hundreds of giant skeletons near the outlet of Lake Nakabay in northeast Wisconsin. The article says, one skull was about three times the size of the ordinary human and other bones were correspondingly big. And this was in 1904 in the index, Wasaki, Wisconsin. So I printed out some stuff. So if I ever go up there, I'll be able to kind of be like, the giants walked here, you know. Also, they had strange skeletons found, um, Lake Delavan. 18 skeletons, heads presumably those of men, much larger than heads of any race which inhabit America today. Very strange, like protruding jaws and teeth in the front of the jaw like regular molars. There was a story in 1675 in Nine Men's Misery. I don't know if you ever heard about the King Philip's War, but the nine men that were captured by Native Americans were all killed, and one of them was, last name was Buckland, and he had a double row of teeth. It's kind of Kind of odd. Whenever you see a double row or like an extra finger, extra toe, something wrong there. You know? <laughs> so I've never met anyone with that. But uh, yeah, what's kind of interesting, according to New York Times in 1936, known history of the state now goes back 15,000 years. So they were finding death masks in Wisconsin mounds. So I was kind of intrigued by that because, you know, when we, when we started reading this book, my wife and I are reading through it. I like when people use sources, so then they, they use the source. New York Times, of course, you know, has become fake news for many years now, but in the 18s and 19s, it was a very different story. And now, all of a sudden, since Darwinism kicked in, 1947, they fell silent. And anytime you mention giants, it's all a bunch of hooey or something. Well, I do believe in the Bible, and I believe Goliath was at least 9 foot 6 inches tall. And he wasn't like a tall, skinny guy like some of the basketball players, but he would have been probably built like a power lifter, probably he weighed, I don't know, 700 pounds or 800 pounds. He would have been a force to be reckoned with, I'll say that. So if you guys have any interest in uh, wanting to know where some of these spots are, I created a little map that showed places as close as Maple Creek, which I guess is near New London. And that's got, they found giants buried there. Uh, like we said, Lake Nakabay. And a lot of places, imagine that, near Madison and uh, Milwaukee, hot spots. And Madison, as we know, like, they actually have effigies on their campus. They actually have mounds on their campus, which kind of explains a lot to me. There's a lot of madness that goes on at Madison. It's the way they think and the way they do things. And so when you are worshiping the sun and you're worshiping creatures, you're going to have a lot of madness going on. In fact, they have proof in a lot of these places there was a lot of sacrificing going on. They could tell it by the stones and their heavy usage that there was a lot of, you know, there would have been people being sacrificed. Because, you know, if we want to have a good year, we're going to have to kill somebody, right? So it's kind of, kind of weird. So that southern region of Wisconsin, if you ever look it up, the map shows a whole lot of effigy type of stuff going on. So anyways... Kind of interesting, I won't go on and on about it, but uh, very interesting to be prepared for the days we're living in, you know, because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty shocking what is coming out in the news and current events and things like that, stuff that you would never imagine. And so now you hear about giants and aliens and all these things, and with aliens, don't be, don't be buying what they're saying because they want to tell you aliens are going to do this and that, and AI is going to do this and that. Well, stay on the word, you know. Aliens are just, just 
fallen devils anyways or just demons. I don't know all the specifics. I don't think anybody does, but it's not like this extraterrestrial being from some other place. I think they were going to eventually want to sell us on that, but I don't buy it. I think there's a lot of a lot of weird supernatural stuff that's happened to this planet and we see happening in our lives as we get closer to that day when Jesus comes back. So the best thing to do is just stay in the word. It's always rock solid, you know. Stay off your fake news. If you sit there, you'll turn into a drone watching that. You see it happen to people, even older folks. You think they know better. They don't know better. They get brainwashed just like the kids do. So anyways, we thank you, Lord, tonight for this teaching. Uh, thank you for letting me ramble about this a little bit. But we do thank you, Lord. We ask that you help us to be prepared and be ready for these latter days that we're living in, each and every day. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. could be something horrendous. I can't make any promises. could be something wonderful and as we spend time with you, Lord, but it doesn't matter because we have the Word of God that shows us that we'll never fall if we're doers of the Word. So, Lord, we just thank you that no matter what happens on this planet Earth, we can just stand there, we'll watch the storm go by because we're standing on the Word. We're praising and worship you in the middle of the storm like Paul and Silas. We're going to church for as long as this church is open. We thank you, Lord God, and we're not shutting it. But for as long as these doors are open, we're going to be here, Lord. We're going to serve you, and we are going to listen to the Word of God. We want to thank you, Lord God, for all the wonderful things that you've given to us here in America and across the world. We pray that you help us find more opportunities to lead people to Jesus and be soul winners in the last days. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. If anybody's got some tithes and offerings... And uh, just go ahead and raise your hand, and we can get you an envelope. We got one here, and I think it looks like, okay, she, okay, yeah. So, Brother Scott, I don't know if you want to grab an envelope for her or something. That would be great. And I think we'll go ahead, we'll pray over that on Sunday, and we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you all on Sunday morning again yep. for prayer if you can make it. And you all have a great night, and don't let those giants get you.